Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another Wealth Management Advisory Club meeting. Uh, before I introduce our guest speaker today, I just want to remind everybody that we, I did send out the uh, discount code from our last week's meeting with Peter Olito from Wiley and Becker. You should have received that in your emails. And without further ado, today's guest speaker is Stephen uh, Galley from Missy Bokia. Please give the guys your undivided attention. Please ask questions. Um, all I'm going to say so, Stephen, late, take it away. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, can everyone, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So um, thanks for having me today. I apologize I can't be in person. Uh, I, I'm coming at you from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, uh, the historic Getty, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Why I'm here is, uh, well, that's a long story. But anyway, uh, I tried to put together a presentation to go along with a lot of what I'll talk about today to hopefully uh, kind of be informative, fun, um, I tried to put it together with the perspective of what I thought um, you all in the audience uh, might find interesting or, or, or might find helpful. But by all means, you know, uh, feel free to jump in, uh, ask any questions along the way. I'm, I, I know uh, it's probably a diverse audience, so I'm happy to stop and address anything you'd like. So with that being said, you know, I, I thought I'd just... Uh, go through a few things. I mean, I'll introduce, you know, I'll go through myself and my background and my firm and then talk a little bit about what's going on in my business, my industry. Uh, I know, uh, you know, Jack mentioned he'd want to hear a little bit about, you know, how we do things here, you know, our investment process, maybe a little, you know, what we're thinking about in terms of the markets right now. And then I thought I'd just put some thoughts together about other things for potentially you guys to think about uh, when you're thinking about your careers uh, going forward. So, you know, with that, my name is Steve Galley. I've uh, I've been in the financial services business probably about 30 years. Uh, I um, uh, you know I I went to uh, Colgate undergrad. I went to NYU Business School, uh, and I joined uh, Solomon Brothers, uh, the bond trading house, when I had a business school before it became part of Citigroup. Um, and uh, after Citigroup, I moved on to Merrill Lynch, and also in an investment banking position. Uh, and then I moved on to a couple of different positions in both uh, Morgan Stanley Capital International or MSCI, who you may know of as, you know, kind of being the, the, uh, the firm behind all those international indices. Uh, and I also then joined S&P uh, and I worked in their structured finance department, uh, actually also in the mortgage backed securities department. Uh, right during, um, you know, that time when the big short, uh, the big short talks about when the mortgage meltdown happened. So that was pretty interesting. Uh, and then after that, um, I, I actually went into the financial advisory business, uh, which is, you know, uh, which I still am in today. Uh, my function now is I'm the, uh, I'm the, basically the chief investment officer for, for Nisa Vachia. Uh, our firm is, uh, you know, we're an independent financial advisory shop. We, uh, we are part of an accounting firm uh, called Nisavaccia LLP, which is based, their headquarters is in Mount Arlington, New Jersey. Uh, we also have offices there. The Wealth Division has offices there, but we also have other offices in Manhattan and other areas of New Jersey. Um, so uh, with that, I thought I'd, you know, get into a little bit about, you know, what kind of different, how we differentiate ourselves, because as you probably can imagine, I mean, the financial advisory business is, is quite fragmented. So one of the things that's happening right now in our business is a lot of consolidation, right? Uh, because there are lots of bigger firms that are gobbling up smaller firms. And there's also a lot of uh, people who started uh, perhaps a small advisory shop on their own who are now, you know, reaching retirement and are looking forward to, you know, riding off into the sunset, but, you know, leaving their business in good hands and collecting money for leaving their business in good hands. So, uh, one of the issues that 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 are facing a lot of the firms that are trying to grow is that if you want to acquire other financial advisory firms, you have to pay a lot for that. And, you know, in general, in our business, uh, you talk about multiples. So if, for example, uh, you know, a, a firm and a small advisory firm makes, let's say, a million dollars a year in, in net revenues. Right. Well, Anyone who wants to acquire that business, let's say a bigger firm that makes 10 or 20 million a year and wants to buy that smaller firm, they're probably going to have to pay three to four to even up to five times 
that of revenue amount. So in other words, if I've you know, got a nice little advisory shop and I'm making a million dollars a year from my fees, I can expect to collect you know, probably about $4 million from someone who wants to buy that from me. So it's a pretty tough multiple to pay for an acquirer because you, know, you have a lot of risk in doing that, right? Because maybe some clients will defect, a lot of clients are very attached to their advisor and if their advisor leaves, even if the advisor promises they'll be in good hands, they might not believe that. So um, our firm actually, we, when we go after other firms, we have a different strategy. And part of our firm strategy is that we, well, first of all, as an advisory firm, we always believe that the tax and the tax and wealth discipline should not be separate. So one of our biggest things that we do to differentiate ourselves against some of our larger competition is to say, you know, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, when you get your financial statement and it has that disclaimer on the bottom that says, please consult your tax advisor, be, you know, about some of these trades that we're doing. We don't have that disclaimer because we are your tax advisor. Right. So because we think that, you know, our, our slogan is it's not really what you earn, it's what you keep. Right. And so uh, we think that combining uh, tax expertise with financial advisory and wealth management expertise is extremely important. Uh, and we think our clients benefit from that, especially if they take, you know, we do a lot of the things that we counsel them early on in terms of how they set up their retirement plans, especially if they have a small business. Um, uh, what we do initially can really pay off for them in the long run. Uh, and that, that's really the niche we serve. So uh, in every independent firm like ours usually has a broker dealer, right? So you might have heard some other larger broker dealers out there that service independent firms like LPL. Um, but our, our broker dealer is called Avantax. Uh, that's, recent, that's a recently formed, uh, uh, newly named entity in the sense that uh, it combined what used to be known as HD Vest, which was a firm that specialized in tax and wealth, with another firm out of Dallas called First Global, which also specialized in tax plus wealth. Um, so the Avantax is essentially a combination of those two firms and is rapidly trying to expand into the niche that we think is is powerful again which is that wealth plus tax niche because you know it's it's it, it when you try and uh and and the name of the game in this business is to gather assets right because you know it scale wins in this business and that's why of course there is a fierce fight out there to acquire uh anything and everything because scale wins so, um, and we think that if you have, if we have a better story to tell in terms of how we do tax and wealth together, uh, we think we have an advantage in terms of scaling. And the other advantage we have is that if we're trying to target, let's say a small accounting firm that perhaps just started to dip their toe in the water with wealth management, right? So maybe they have a million dollars of tax business that they do and only maybe a couple of hundred thousand of wealth business. Well, guess what? The multiple that we have to pay to buy them isn't going to be three or four or five times their revenue. It's going to be more like one to two times because you don't have to pay as much for a firm for a tax for, for tax revenue as you do for wealth revenue. Right. And so that's one of the niches that we're trying to really exploit in that we want to go after firms uh, where we don't have to compete on a high multiple basis when we're acquiring someone. And that's actually paid off for us because then. If we do acquire that accounting, that small tax or tax practice, for example, it's really up to us to transform that into a bigger wealth business. And so that's what we're gambling on is that we can take that small tax business and actually turn it into a much bigger wealth business later uh, and thereby avoid paying the wealth, that big multiple up front, but ultimately down the road, hopefully selling for a much higher multiple because we turned it into a more of a wealth business. Um, and like I always say, you know, it's it also in this business, the reason it's also still very fragmented is because, you know, in many senses, it's, this is a belly to belly business still. Uh, clients who entrust their, you know, financial fortunes to you, they like to look you in the eye. They like to see you in person. They like to feel like they know you and that you know them. So um, that's another thing we try and sell is that, you know, we're not this big uh, amorphous institution uh, with some corporate agenda to push down our clients' uh, throats. We are sort of that independent, you know, we give you that small office feel, we connect with our clients, and of course we have that niche of tax plus wealth. So that's kind of, you know, how where we operate and what we think is a good position to be in. And, you know, quite frankly, independents are actually doing better 
uh, right now. You know, if you look at asset flows in, in our industry, you know, some of the bigger places like the Wells Fargo's, the Morgan Stanley's and whatnot. So they're doing fine, but the independents are doing better. Right. Because I think in many cases there is some skepticism about some of the um, hidden agendas behind some of the larger institutions. So, you know, we try and exploit that when we're when we're trying to sell against them. Any uh, any questions so far? OK, great. So. One of the things we do as far as uh, investment process is that, you know, for us as an independent, you know, we don't have it's not like we have a big research department that, you know, does all our investing for us. Right. We pretty much do it ourselves. As a matter of fact, I pretty much do it since I'm the chief investment officer. So how do we do that or how do I do that? Well, one of the things that we do and, and are we're fortunate in that we have access to a lot of institutional money managers um, uh, software as well as their as well as their model portfolio. So. For example, we can, we know we can we can ask BlackRock for what their model portfolios are for a given risk spectrum. We can do the same thing with Goldman Sachs. We can do the same thing with Fidelity. So we can. So the first thing that we look at is what are the big guys doing in terms of asset allocation? You know, what are they doing in U.S. versus versus international? What are they doing in small cap versus large cap versus mid cap? What are they doing in growth versus value? Um, and so once we feel like we have a good feel about, you know, kind of what the larger institutions are doing from a macro asset allocation, we then model our own asset allocations after that, right? And give or take a few percentages here or there, we don't deviate too much. So once we feel like we can nail down the asset allocation, then it's all about, well, how do we execute that allocation? What funds or ETFs or individual equities or bonds are we gonna use to do that? And we kind of have a two prong process. You know, funds and ETFs, we, we, we use Morningstar extensively for, for fund and ETF screening, but I think that's a great database. Of course, all this comes at a price, but uh, you know, that's probably one of the best ones out there. Um, and we kind of have proprietary screens that we've set up so that you know, we're, all, we're not looking for the most recent performance and the best performing funds. We're looking actually at more long-term, steady eddy for, uh, funds and ETFs that have proven themselves over time. And one of the things we tell clients is that, you know, we're not putting you into anything that we don't think has survived, you know, some serious market moves, right? So that's why we're always looking at more of the, the 10 year and five year track record, not necessarily just the last one or two or three years. Um, as far as individual equities go, that's really where we also try and differentiate in that a lot of advisors that we know on the smaller side, they can't really offer clients individual equity portfolios, but if, or if they do, they outsource that, meaning, they kind of pay an outside manager to put together a portfolio of stocks that then that, that then, of course, the advisor sacrifices a lot of his fees because he outsources that to some other firm. We actually do that in house. And one of the ways we do that is by using other outside resource source, research sources that we have a lot of confidence in. And I highlighted one on this slide. We use value line extensively. Um, you might have heard of value line. It's been around for decades. Um, you know, it kind of fo follows that Benjamin Graham. Uh, you know, Warren Buffett discipline of, you know, investing in companies that have strong balance sheet, good cash flows, you know, transparent financials. Uh, so we think that's a great starting point for us when we're putting together a portfolio, because, again, we're not looking to, you know, invest in, you know, an unproven company that just just did an IPO. We're actually we're our clients are more interested in, you know, one of the things we tell our clients, especially the successful ones, is that, you know, you, Mr. Client, have hit the home run. Uh, it's not our job to hit you home runs with your investments. It's our job to protect them and just hit steady singles and make sure that it grows for you and, and that we protect it. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that, you know, when we're looking at uh, investments, we try and make sure that we're erring on more of the conservative side. And, you know, it was funny when, uh, and I don't know if any of you are thinking about getting various designations. Um, you know, I have my, my CFP or Certified Financial planner designation as well as the, the CPWA, which is a certified private wealth advisor. But when I was doing my CFP, <laughs> the, the, I couldn't believe it. When I was going through the textbook, I actually found a, uh, a citing in the CFP book itself that talks about the value line enigma. Um, you know, the bottom line is if you believe in efficient markets, uh, you know, it's very hard for managers to beat an index, you know, a la why Vanguard is Vanguard, because, you know, indexing is basically hard to beat over time, right? But there is something called the value line effect, 
which is basically cited here in the textbook that was saying that, you know, stocks at value line ranks highly actually have shown to outperform over time versus, you know, um, versus, uh, you know, a typical index. So, um, you know, that's one of the reasons that we felt comfortable leveraging a particular research source that, you know, other academic sources have actually quoted as being quite good. So, um, that, that's sort of a little background on our investment process. Any, any questions so far? Okay, so I thought I'd give some perspective on financial markets, uh, just because right now, you know, th this year has been a lot different than last year. Um, you know, last year, actually, if you think about it, was, was kind of boring uh, in a good way. Uh, you know, the S&P 500 last year never dropped more than 5%. Uh, that's very rare, actually, because on average, the S&P drops by at least 15% in any given year. So, you know, there was really not a lot of volatility last year. Uh, that's not the case this year, right? The S&P has already dropped over 10% this year. It's, you know, it's, it's still down this year, but it's come back some. Uh, the NASDAQ already had a full-blown correction of over 20%. So did the Russell 2000. So financial markets this year have been, have been a lot different. Um, and so, and what, one of the reasons behind that, and I highlight on this page, is the bond market has been a lot different, right? Last year, we were still dealing with, you know, almost, you know, super low, a super low interest rate environment, you know, close to zero. That's not the case anymore. I mean, you can see here, you know, the uh, the 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 orange the orange lines represent, and I don't know if my screen is cutting off some of the graphics here. I'll try and move it, but the orange lines represent where we were in terms of prices on various bond uh, bond bonds uh, sectors at the end of the year, at the end of la or the beginning of this year rather. And the um, the blue solid blue line is where we are today. These, I can assure you, are staggering moves in, in, in bonds in a very, very short period of time. And that has really, um, well, that has hurt a lot of people, especially ones who rely on consistent income uh, and, and who have a lot of bonds in their portfolios. Because as we know, you know, when, uh, you know, when, when bond yields go up, which they've been doing very quickly, uh, bond prices go down. Um, so the only sector that hasn't been hit that hard, no surprise, is, is, the, uh, is the Treasury and, uh, you know, TIPS bonds or Treasury and, and Inflation Protected Securities. Because, well, why? Well, because inflation has risen dramatically, and that's what a lot of people are talking about, uh, inflation. So, you know, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about inflation. So, but I also just wanted to point out, uh, you know, in just one year, the 10-year Treasury bond, which is really considered the benchmark Treasury, that's what mortgage-backed securities are benchmarked off of. Uh, you know, rising over 1.3% in, in a year, that type of move is, is unprecedented. And, you know, if you think about the duration of a 10-year bond, which give or take is about six or seven years, what, you know, if you're familiar with the concept of, of duration, you know, any duration essentially, you know, if you boil it down to what it means, it means that if a bond price moves up or down, by, or if, if bond yields move up or down by 1%, and the duration is let's say six or seven, then the then the bond is going to move by six or seven percent, which is exactly what's happened, right? The ten-year Treasury bond. Anyone who's been in the ten-year Treasury and, and you know bought it over a year ago has lost you know close to double digits in, in in their investment, which in a bond is a massive move. People buy bonds more for stability, uh, and they haven't really seen that. So you know clients are panicking a little bit because of that. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are talking about, oh, the yield curve had inverted. So I thought it'd be interesting just to take a look that, you know, if you looked at a year ago, I mean, the yield curve wasn't, you know, it's not like we had a very steep curve, you know, uh, at the end of at the end of last year. But we certainly don't. It's a lot flatter now. And, you know, so another indicate a classic indicator of a looming recession is an inverted yield curve. Uh, inverted meaning long term bond yields are a lot lower than or at least a little lower than short term bond yields. And, you know, and why would that be the case? Why would anyone buy a long term bond that's yielding less than a short term bond? And, you know, the answer is, is because, well, they actually think that the long term bond people know what they're doing. And, you know, as a former bond guy, I can tell you, you know, bond guys think, you know, we think we're smarter than we, the equity guys uh, because we look at the long term and, we, you know, we're all about math. And basically what the yield curve tells you when it's inverted is that they think a recession is happening at the, at the long range projections of the U.S. economy aren't that good and don't merit, um, you know, having yields at the, at the, at the longer end higher than, than they are currently. Uh, and the short end is telling you that, yeah, that may be the case, 
but we still know that you know at right now you know we we think things we we're really horrified by inflation so we're going to bid we're going to bid the short end up which is exactly what happens so you don't really see an inverted yield curve very often and 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 it, and while it has usually been a good predictor of recessions it, it's not always the case right you know uh, back in 2019 we had an inverted yield curve and this the market still went up by like by, by for for like another seven months before we had any problems and that was when you know COVID hit so it's not the perfect predictor but it's still pretty good I thought I'd just also talk about you know what's happening with unemployment you might have heard you know unemployment's at a record low rate and that's true and we're also seeing a lot of wage inflation. So one of the reasons I think this chart is really fascinating, and you know, it's something to think about, is that the blue line is 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 wage growth, right? And the black line is the unemployment rate. So you'll notice that um, the dotted line is the average rate of unemployment over the last 50 years, and that's hovered generally around six percent. And the blue dotted line is the average rate of wage growth or wage inflation over the last 50 years. Right. So in general, basically over the last 50 years, you know, the unemployment rate hovered around 6% and the wage growth is generally around 4%. But what you'll notice is every time the unemployment rate crosses below the average unemployment rate. So in other words, every, every, usually when it drops below 6%, what happens? It's almost like a perfect inverse relationship. What happens is that wage growth starts to accelerate. And then once the unemployment rate starts to rise again and go up, go past the average, wage growth starts to decelerate. But what's going on right now? Well, actually, it's kind of hard to tell, right? What's going on? What's going on right now is that we obviously had a massive spike in unemployment because of the pandemic. And that's over. Now, the unemployment rate is well below its long term average. Actually, it's basically at a 50 year low. And now we are seeing wage growth spike. So if the relationship that we've seen holds true, uh, I don't really see wage growth moderating anytime soon, right? And the only way wage, wage, wage growth is gonna moderate, and by the way, wages, wage growth is a huge component of inflation, and the only way wage growth is gonna moderate is if the unemployment rate gets back close to 6%. I don't know, if, I don't know about any of you, but I don't really see that happening anytime soon. So I think this is a concern. And if you, if you think inflation is a problem, I would agree to the extent that wage growth is definitely one of the biggest problems that we're facing. And that's why we have an inverted yield curve, among other things. So I thought that was a really interesting chart to point out. So a lot of people are also talking about there's a lot of naysayers out there saying, oh, you know, inflation's transitory. It's temporary. You know, it's going to come back down. Well, maybe maybe that's true a little bit. But if you look at this chart, you'll notice that. Um, the transitory part of inflation is really this top bracket right which is really composed of energy like new and used cars and mostly you know food the sticky part of inflation though is at the bottom which is like housing uh restaurants uh and other stuff other stuff being you know everything but food energy and cars so yes are used cars prices coming down yes we've seen some numbers to indicate that oh will i mean the, and by the way they say the biggest cure for higher or higher oil prices is higher oil prices, because then what happens? Well, people start ramping up the production of oil, which then usually brings the price down. But that being said, you'll notice that there is still, even though a lot of what is considered transitory inflation right now, there's still a lot that's not. There's still a lot of stickiness. And with the wage growth I was just talking about, I think we, we're still gonna have an inflation problem for quite some time. And I think that's gonna be a problem for the markets. So that's one of the reasons that we've been preaching some caution to our, to our clients. But there are some, there, you know, it's not all gloom and doom, right? And one of, the, one of the great things is that the consumer is in great shape. Um, and one of the reasons the consumer is in great shape is because their balance sheets are in great shape, right? You can see here that, you know, and again, I'm going to try and move the, uh, the my, uh, I'm trying to move the picture here, but I'm having not that much success. But basically, household debt as a percentage of their outstanding of overall debt is at its lowest point since basically the 80s. And in addition, there's an additional $2 trillion of excess savings that is built up because of the pandemic that people want to spend, right? So, you know, yes, inflation's a problem, but people are totally prepared to pay the higher prices that they're going to face. 
And so, you know, one of the things that we always talk about when we talk about equity markets is it's all about earnings. And if companies are able to, you know, ha still earn what you still, still beat their earnings growth that they had in the prior year, equities are going to be just fine. So one of the things that usually helps companies is when the consumer is in good shape. And I can assure you the consumer is, is probably in the best shape they've been in, in, in a couple of decades. So that's definitely one of the silver linings. So real quick, let's just talk about the market. I love talking about the market. I can talk about the market all day. Clients like to talk about the market. Uh, that doesn't mean you should always talk to them about, market, about the market because sometimes they get really nervous. But if you look at the market today, right, uh, I think this is an interesting shut the slide because it kind of shows all the different types of valuation measures to say, you know, hey, is the market expensive or not? You know, clients always ask, you know, should we be investing now? Should we wait? Almost any measure you want to look at, whether it's price to earnings ratio, price to book, price to cash flow, it's basically telling you the market is overvalued, right? The, the middle dotted line is the 25 year average of the PE ratio, the forward PE ratio of the S&P 500, which is around 16, 17. Right now, we're certainly above that, but certainly not as bad as we were uh, a few months ago. Uh, so are we, are we high in regards to, you know, on an average PE? Yes. Are we high in terms of price to book? Absolutely. Price to cash? Yes. But there is one measure that's not overvalued, and that is what's called the earnings yield spread. I love this measure uh, because ascent, what is the earnings yield spread? The earnings yield spread takes it con into consideration the bond market. So the earnings yield is basically the earnings of the S&P 500 companies, which give or take is around two, two, $210 or so, uh, divided by the S&P price, which right now is, I can't, I didn't, you know, 4,600, 4,700 or so. You take the earnings yield of the S&P and then you subtract what you can get from an investment grade bond, or in this case, a, you know, a triple B bond. And that gives you the earnings yield spread. And right now, it's why, so because if I want to make some money, well, the bottom line is I'm really not making it in bonds. And this gets into that acronym TINA. There is no alternative, right? And so until people feel like they actually can make a reasonable return in bonds, and right now they have come up. So if you're positive return. But anyone who's been, who's been invested in bonds in the last year or so, well, they have a... So that's one of the things that are certainly supporting the market. And yes, other valuations or measures, measures are high, but relative to bonds, that a lot of it comes down to earnings. And you might have noticed, I don't know if you all uh, heard you know, the other day, Netflix over the last five days or so. And uh, I personally was just shocked at their earnings report. I mean, that they actually lost subscribers. And it wasn't just me that was shocked. Obviously, the market was shocked because that Netflix dropped like a stone uh, and basically wiped out over half their market value in less than a day. So you'll notice on this, on this page that the market cap of Netflix, at least that's as of a couple of days ago, was about $100, $100 billion days ago. Um, and so in other words, the market was saying Netflix and Disney should be valued about the same. Well, not anymore because Disney is, I, Disney is well over a 200 or so million, billion dollar market cap and Netflix is no longer that. So the market corrected its opinion of Netflix very fast. Why? Because of earnings. And that's why earnings are really, really important. So that's why it's really important to look at, you know, which companies are going to be able to withstand inflation, which companies are going to be able to take all the inflation that they're facing in terms of their input costs. And who can do that are the companies that are going to win. So, you know, we've certainly been trying to steer uh, clients in that direction. Another thing that I think is interesting is, you know, we're always talking to clients about buy, buy low, sell high, right? Isn't that what you always want to do as an investor, buy low, sell high? So, well, you can't really buy low right now almost anywhere you look in the U.S. in terms of equities, but you can internationally, right? So this chart, I think, is kind of cool because it looks at, you know, the historical average or this is the 20 year average P.E. ratio of the S&P 500, which is, you know, about 15 or 16. And the 20 year average of the, uh, you know, all country world index right now is that we are almost two and a half international stocks are two and a half standard deviations lower than normal than they normally are versus U.S. So in other words, if you're looking at, you know, uh, in, an industrial uh, manufacturing company in the U.S. and an industrial manufacturing company in Europe, the European one is really cheap relative to the U.S. So if you want to buy something cheap at least cheap relative to the US, you got to think international. And, you know, a lot of people don't have the stomach for that. You know, international is scary, right? Look what's happening in, with, you know, Ukraine and the war. Uh, look what happened when Japan, you know, clamped, uh, clamped down on, on their technology sector. 
that's why it's more reasonably valued. It's hard to invest in things when people are scared, but right now international. And why is that? Well, because the US has trounced international for the last decade or so, right? International hasn't been that great in the last decade. We think that's gonna change. And not only do we think it's because the equity valuation is more reasonable, but it's also because the US dollar we think is abnormally high. And if the US dollar starts to correct, and if you look at our trade deficit, it's basically uh, in, in a pretty bad place. We have a really, our trade deficit is, is getting close to you know, untenable levels. When that actually starts to become an, an issue, the US dollar will decline. And believe me, you really want international exposure when the US dollar declines. The other thing I wanna talk about international wise is not too many people uh, talk about what's happening in emerging markets, but one of the reasons that we like international emerging markets versus international developed is because of the growth of the international emerging market middle class. Uh, that is a very powerful driver of equity, equity, equity returns over time. And you can see you know, in the chart here what the predictions are for the growth of, of the middle class in various countries like India, Indonesia, China, Brazil, Mexico, uh, and in Europe, it actually might decline. So you're not gonna see this tailwind of, of, of buying power by a huge percentage of the population uh, represented by the middle class. Why, when we talk to clients about international, we also talk of the, more, of, of, of the markets that perhaps are a little more volatile, but probably have more, a greater return potential over time, especially because of the growth of this middle class phenomenon. Okay, so enough about markets, uh, uh, but I can tell you that, that one of the things that, and I, the second bullet point I hear is an, uh, down here is an acronym called uh, you know, SITE, which, I, which I, I, that's an acronym for, um, uh, Sales is a transfer of enthusiasm. And so, you know, in my business, uh, one of the most important things that really helps with, with, with bringing in assets is clients want to know that you really care about what you're doing. You know, uh, so I work with a lot of advisors in my firm because I'm the investment officer. A lot of times I'm, I'm invited into meetings with, you know, uh, my, my, my fellow advisors, clients, because, you know, they might not be that comfortable about talking what's happening in the markets, but I am. So they'll bring me in and I'll start talking about the markets. I'll maybe start talking about certain stocks that the clients own. And I'm pretty passionate about it, right? I can talk about that all day. And guess what? The clients like that, right? They want to know that, wow, that guy really cares about the market. That guy really cares about the stuff we're invested in. I want to make sure that that guy's watching my stuff, right? So in almost any business I've ever been in, when you have someone who really is passionate about what they're doing, it kind of sells itself. Because I personally, I'm not a good salesman, right? As a matter of fact, I think I'm a horrible salesman. So I'm not the guy who's going to go convince someone at the local that. But I can. One of the things we try to do at our firm is try and put the right people in the right positions. Like one of my one of my partners, he can talk to anyone about anything and anywhere. Uh, you know, he can actually, he, I think he can actually, uh, you know, pretty much find a, a bone buried in the desert. He's that kind of guy. He's great at putting clients in fight. And so sometimes you have to kind of mix and match your, your strengths to make sure that you've got a team that, you know, that plays to their strengths. And we, in our, in our firm, we call, kind of call that ball on T. And, you know, so I think that's okay. And I think that's, and, and I, another point I have is here, people take different paths, right? Uh, you know, my path into this business was probably different than a lot of other people's paths. You know, some people take the harder path of just trying to build a book of business by themselves. And that's great. And I, I couldn't have done it that way. Uh, and, you know, so it, it's, there are different ways to get into this business. And, and I think the most important thing, though, is you have to really like what you're doing, because if you don't, it's going to manifest itself in ways that probably, you know, is going to it's going to maybe hamper your, your, your growth rate. Um, one of the other things I wanted to mention too in this business, and you know, sorry for all you guys out there who you know are, are are white males, but we, in general, the financial advisory business is 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 dominated by white males. Now, you know, uh, that's not a terrible thing. Obviously, that's it is what it is. But I can assure you that most firms that are wanting to diversify their client base are also looking to diversify their advisor base. Right? Female advisors are in high demand you know, minority advisors are in high demand. And quite frankly, they're very, very hard to find. So, you know, that's not being said that if you're, you know, a white male that you're, you know, gonna have a hard time getting a job. I think you're in demand too, but I can assure you that the diversity factor is a really important thing for a lot of firms because, you know, especially firms that are trying to make sure that, you know, 
if, if we want to, let's say, move into, you know, a different client base that we're normally serving, we have to have advisors that actually that relate more to that client base. So that's why I think diversity is really important. So, you know, for those of you out there that, that you know, uh, uh, fit that bill, yeah, I think that's going to be that's going to be a great thing, because I can assure you we've been desperate to find, you know, not just female advisors, but also, you know, um, you know, Asian advisors, Latino advisors, you know, African-American advisors, um, uh, we think that, that they're going to be remain in high demand for a long time. Uh, by the way, uh, the other thing I put on this screen is that, um, and this is one thing I, one thing I wish I knew, you know, way back when was that when you're talking to someone about, you know, what you want to do or where you want to work, um, I, I, I really feel like having a good story to tell is really important. Uh, you know, because one of the most important things that someone wants to hear is, you know, what floats her boat? You know, what gets her juices flowing? Um, actually, I probably shouldn't have said that. That probably sounds a little, uh, you know, but, but, you know, so, but what, what makes her, what makes her excited about working? What makes her excited about, you know, working late, about putting in the extra effort, about, you know, who's going to cover my back, you know, at my firm? Who's going to find problems and solve them before I even know they're there? So that's the type of story that, you know, you want to be able to tell to anyone. So there's a, a Harvard Business Review article that, you know, came out, I think at least, you know, uh, over a decade ago, but it still holds true today. It's called What's Your Story? And it kind of goes through, you know, the thought process of how you kind of put together, you know, what is your story? How do you want to tell your story to different, you know, to different audiences? Do you have to change it depending on who you're talking to or should you change it or should you stick to, you know, stick to the same one? So I think that's a really valuable uh, a read in case of in case if you if you can't access it yourself I have I have a PDF copy and I'll email it to anyone who, who wants to check it out but you know I found that really important because I can assure you when we are looking for people and we're we're trying to figure out if the person's the right fit it's really the story that they tell us uh, and and the story that we hear that that you know that that you know it's kind of like it, it, we want to feel like we understood who we were talking to and when you have a good story to tell the chances of us really understanding who we're talking to and getting a good feeling about that increase exponentially all right so i've been talking a mile a minute uh i wanted to make sure we had plenty of time for for q a um and you know if anyone needs to you know get in touch with me uh you know i, I put my email here uh happy to speak about any topic anytime you know the floor is yours for any questions. I have a question. Sure. So I would first want to thank you so much for coming and for the great presentation. We appreciate it. Um, I'm also the vice president of the club. Thank you so much for coming. Like I said, uh, my question is, can you please explain more about the different accounting internships you offer? Like what are the opportunities for accounting students that you're offering? Ah, good. Okay, good question. So, um, and I apologize because I'm much, I'm really focused almost exclusively on the wealth side. But what I can do is if, you know, you get in touch with me, I can make sure I get you, I get you in touch with the right person at our accounting firm that we work hand in hand with to make sure that they can get you the information about internship opportunities, um, you know, whatever employment opportunities there are, um, because I know, because they're actually a lot larger than us. I mean, the accounting firm we work with, I want to say has about, Mm, two to three hundred employees you know the wealth advisors you know i'm one of them we're only about you know 10 we're about a dozen so the accounting firm we work with a lot larger and by the way you know I, I should have mentioned you know working with an accounting firm in this business is fantastic because as you can imagine it's the ultimate feeder if you've been doing someone's taxes for years imagine if they're like a small business owner they tend to trust their accountants implicitly and let's say the small business owner says, you know what, I need to set up a retirement plan, not just for myself, but for my employees. Well, what does the accountant do? He says, you know, I know that guy, Steve Galley on the wealth side can help you with that. He's really good at that stuff. Here you go, Steve. And I say, thanks, Jane accountant, you're the best. And it's the, it's a natural feeder. So that's, I, I mean, I, maybe that was obvious, but I, I should have mentioned that that's one of the reasons that we think that that marriage is so important. Um, but I will, Gloria, be happy to put you in touch with um, the uh, RHR people in the accounting firm if, if, if you want to look into that. That is great. Thank you so much. I, pre I appreciate it a lot. I'm a sophomore accounting major myself, so I'm really interested in, to see like what you guys offer in like that field for accounting majors. Thank you so much. 
Sure, and you know, sorry, I, I was gonna I was gonna add something, but any other questions? Hi, I have a yeah. question. Oh. Yeah, there you go. Sure. I just wanted to uh, have you uh, say, um, did you say that the market is overvalued right now? Yes, I did. Um, I just question that as in, um, I know like many um, stocks themselves that have lost over 40% of their share price within like past months, like to a year now almost. So like with that being said, in so many accounts, like even that I trade with or like other people that I know that they trade with, um, not to get all informal, but like we're pretty down bad right now. So I kind of question how the market can be so overvalued when so many stocks have lost a great deal of their share price. Excellent question. So, and again, I, I can talk about this all day, but first of all, remember, you know, when we're talking about the market, we're, uh, let's just use the S&P as the market for now, but some people define the market differently. Some people talk about the Dow. I think that's stupid. It's only 30 stocks. That's not the market. The S&P 500 is a reasonable approximation of the market. Um, so let's just use the S&P as a proxy for now. But, you know, when I talk about the market, it's an aggregate, right? So are there stocks that have been beaten up lately? Absolutely, right? You know, tech stocks for one have, you know, some of them have taken a severe beating. And, you know, why is that? Well, when you think about it, a lot of tech stocks um, or, or and, and, and also growth stocks, right? What, what's the definition of a growth stock? Well, you know, you don't buy a growth stock because you get a nice dividend. Right. It's not like, you you know, you're you buy a growth stock because you want the price to go up. And why is the price going to go up? Well, the price is going to go up because the stock keeps gaining market share and gaining customers. Even if it's not making a lot of money now, it's supposedly going to make a lot of money in the future. Tesla is a great example of this. Right. Tesla is priced right now as if it will become the largest, most successful electric car maker in the universe. Right. So. Now, I'm not saying Tesla's, uh, you know, priced incorrectly. I mean, if you believe in market theory, Tesla is priced exactly where it should be based upon supply and demand. That being said, uh, you know, so was Netflix only a few days ago until their earnings rolled in <laughs> and then things changed in a heartbeat. Right. So my, the, one of the reasons that growth stocks and tech in particular have been hit hard lately is because when interest rates go up quickly, right? you are as an investor you're less excited about waiting for the future of the growth stocks to pan out because if i can now invest in a 10-year treasury bond and by the way now i can get almost three percent from a 10-year treasury which by the way is still a negative real rate of return if you think about inflation right i'm still actually not i'm losing money taking into inflation account but certainly three percent today from the 10-year treasury is a hell of a lot better than less than one percent a year ago so if I can actually earn a decent amount of interest today from either a bond or a dividend paying stock, a la an injured energy stock like Chevron, for example, which pays like almost a four to 5% dividend, I am less inclined to buy a growth stock that pays no dividend and is supposedly only going to go up in price and may only go up in price because things happen five years from now, right? So that's kind of what we call the duration effect. When, when interest rates climb up, long duration stocks, in other words, stocks that their growth is based upon stuff that hasn't happened yet, are less attractive. So when you say some things have been beaten up and maybe they're not that expensive anymore, yes, I think on an individual level, there are always maybe bargains out there because you know individual, anything can happen to any particular stock. But in aggregate, if you look at the price or the forward price earnings ratio of the S&P, and you know that the average is around 15 or 16, it is a lot higher than that. So on average, you are paying more for every dollar of earnings for a stock in a, on average than you normally should, right? So that's that's when I say it's overvalued, right? And But that's why I also point out on average, that's not the case internationally. On average now, you're paying a lot less for a dollar of earnings from international stocks than you would normally. So you know what? Sign me up for that. Buy low, hopefully, internationally. Now, again, International might still underperform for the foreseeable future. We don't know, but I'm willing to at least take the gamble that at least I'm not buying something that's already expensive. And by the way, it's also a nice natural hedge against a, a weak dollar. And the dollar has been pretty darn good for a long time. And believe me, it doesn't always stay that way. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the part of the dialogue we have with clients. 
No, thank you very much. I really enjoyed that answer and uh, kind of hearing about almost how the market is fundamental as well. Um, just one last thing. Would you say that maybe investors became more risk averse because they're more willing to put their money into these bonds instead of into the market? Uh, I wouldn't say that investors became more risk averse. I think in, in general, investors have a given level of risk on average out there. I don't think that's really changed. Um, what I think has changed is that um, their options for putting their money in places that might yield a reasonable return with less risk are now a little more attractive, right? So because of that, the assets can shift from, hey, you know, even though my risk tolerance is, is, is X, you know, I think I'm more comfortable getting at least a more reasonable return from a bond now, because now I know at least I'm not getting just 1%, now I'm getting 3%. So I'd rather get 3% with lower risk than a guesstimate on this growth stock where I don't know what's gonna happen in the future. So I think it's just a, sh a question of shifting around based upon you know, your attitude about where you wanna put your assets. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. Sure. All right, so now I have my question. Um, similar to what Gloria's question is, do you know of any account, not account internships, any uh, finance or wealth management internships for our fellow members here at the uh, Wealth Management Biden Club? Because I know they're looking for internships in the summer, maybe possibly in the fall. Yeah, so um, we, we're, I mean, we're always looking for, you know, talented individuals. So uh, uh, we, because we're 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 a little smaller than than the well, we're a lot smaller than the accounting firm. We don't have anything formal per se, but on an informal basis, absolutely. You know, and our our offices are in Mount Darlington, which I think from your campus is reasonably close. Uh, I think maybe a half hour or so, if give or take. You know, right off we're right off Route 80. Um, but so definitely reach out if you have interest, um, and we can you know we can talk about our various options uh, in terms of you know. Uh, whether it be an internship or, you know, if, if there's, if, if you're interested in, you know, full-time employment, um, you know, we, we, we can definitely talk about that. I, I should also add that some people always ask me about, you know, designations, right? And so, um, and, you know, I, I, I've had my, I have my share, you know, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I can talk about the CFP if you'd like, or the CPWA, uh, one of the sister designations to the CPWA is the uh, the CEMA, which is the Certified Investment Management Associate, I think. Um, and then there's the CFA, right? So in the world of investing, right, I, I would, and, and then there's the MBA in finance. I have my MBA in finance too. But the I don't have my CFA. That's kind of the designation I don't have. I will tell you that I do think the CFA is 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 really great, right? Because one thing about the CFA, if you if you if you're at any institutional money manager and you're a portfolio manager, invariably many of them have their CFAs, right? The CFA is hard to get, and the good thing about the CFA for any of you who are also you know into accounting is that the first level of the CFA exam is really heavily accounted. It's it's you know because a CFA is expected to be able to dig into a company's numbers and basically opine on whether that company is a good investment, and the only only way you can do that truly is if you really know how to dig through a company's numbers, which means you really need to know accounting. So that's kind of the foundation of the CFA. And then, you know, the higher levels of the CFA get into more investment theory and whatnot. So um, I, I think the CFA is a great designation to have. As a matter of fact, I would argue it's a hell of a lot more important than an MBA in finance. Uh, and I think it's harder to get. So, you know, that I think is the gold standard uh, for the investment management industry. Do you have to have it? I mean, well, I'm doing what I'm doing. I don't have it. So no, you don't have to have it. Um, but it, you know, it does help. And, you know, I think after that, if you, if you want to be in the advisory business, I do think the CFP is really looked at as, as a pretty solid designation. Um, as a matter of fact, now it's almost kind of like the price of entry. Like I, I don't know many advisors who lack that designate well i know a few don't have that designation but usually they have some some other type of designation but the cfp is looked as on pretty highly and the investments and wealth institute or the iwi um is the one behind the cpwa which is the certified private wealth advisor which i which i have also 
I'm going to say, tell you that I really enjoyed getting that designation, um, partially because I loved digging into the problems that rich people have with their money. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's a great idea to have a designation that basically says, I'm qualified to talk to you if you have a lot of money. And that's pretty much what the CPWA represents, you know, because that gets into a lot of um, estate planning uh, and, you know, optionality theory and ways to help people protect their assets, to pass it on to future generations with, with you know, low tax consequence, um, to help people like with complicated, you know, employee stock option situations. Those are the types of clients I want to have. I don't know about you, but I, I, those are the clients I want to have. So that's one of the reasons I like that designation. And um, you can't get that designation unless you already have the CFP or the SEMA which is the Certified Investment Management uh, Associate. And the SEMA is pretty good too. You know, the SEMA is, is kind of like the CFP. So if you, if you were gung-ho about getting the CPWA, then you could just do the SEMA and then the CPWA and probably forget about the CFP. Um, and if you've got the CFA, then you could forget about all of them and just get the CFA. And I think, you know, you'd be okay. Any other questions for um, anyone on Zoom? Okay, uh, that is all. Thank you so much, Stephen, for coming to speak to us today. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, really, it was a pleasure. Um, you know, I wish you all the best of luck in whatever you're doing. Feel free to reach out with any questions. And again, for anyone who's thinking about job opportunities and whatnot, definitely reach out. Um, and we, you know, hopefully we can continue the dialogue. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, all Manager by the club members, please stay on for a couple of announcements. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Stephen. Thank you so much for Thank coming. You. Thank you very much.